arsenothriacin is a broad-spectrum arsenic-based antibiotic, effective against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. It is effective against major pathogens, such as carbapenem-resistant Enterobacter cloacae, one of the World Health Organization's global priority pathogens. Arsenothriacin is a naturally occurring antibiotic. It was discovered when it was found to be produced by a mutant of the rice rhizosphere bacterium Burkholderia gladioli, which uses it to kill other bacteria, while it itself is resistant. Uniquely, arsenothriacin contains arsenic, and it is a small molecule that is a non-proteinogenic amino acid analog of glutamate. More specifically, it chemically resembles the important intermediate gamma-glutamyl phosphate, used in the glutamine synthetase catalytic cycle. Arsenothriacin inhibits the glutamine synthetase enzyme, rendering the bacterium incapable of producing glutamine and losing the ability to control ammonia toxicity, in the end, resulting in inhibited growth or death. Humans also possess the glutamine synthetase enzyme and use it for the same purpose, but the human enzyme is slightly different, making it a lot less affected by arsenothriacin. New and effective antibiotics like this are important in combating the increasing amount of bacteria that are becoming resistant to currently used antibiotics. It is expected that we will eventually run out of options to treat many different infections, as antibiotic resistance develops faster than we currently develop antibiotics. So to discover a synthetic way to produce this new antibiotic is important for large-scale production, as production using this specific bacterium is limited and complicated. There have been a few studies that produced it synthetically, and in this video, I will repeat one of those methods and see if it has any antibiotic properties. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating block, and I add in 250 ml of water as a solvent. Then as a reagent, I add in 100.5 grams of arsenic trioxide. Now I weigh out 144 grams of sodium hydroxide and dissolve it in 500 ml of water. I add all of the solution to the flask, and it starts to react immediately with the arsenic trioxide to form soluble sodium orthoarsenide. To that, I can gradually add the next reagent which is 80 ml of 1,2-dichloroethane. I then attach a condenser without running water, just to minimize losses from evaporation, and I then leave this to stir at 60 C for 2 days. In this reaction, the 1,2-dichloroethane reacts with the form sodium orthoarsenide, the form sodium 2 chloroethyl arsenate, and sodium chloride. Afterward, it is acidified with hydrochloric acid to form the corresponding arsenic acid. First, Arsenic trioxide reacts with aqueous sodium hydroxide to form sodium orthoarsenide, which is a nucleophile. So, it detects one of the electron deficient carbons of 1,2-dichloroethane, kicking off the chlorine while also moving an electron pair from one of the oxygens to form a double bond with the arsenic. We are then left with the sodium 2 chloroethyl arsenate and sodium chloride. This reaction isn't very efficient, and the yield in the literature is only 12%. It can also eliminate the other chlorine, forming the vinyl derivative. And perhaps, it could form the diarsenate. Also, dichloroethane is not a very polarized molecule, so it isn't very susceptible to this reaction. Anyhow, afterward it will be acidified to form 2-chloroethyl arsenic acid. When I come back 2 days later, it is completely transparent, and I then replace the condenser with a short path distillation apparatus, and distill off about half of the water. When that's done, I neutralize the excess sodium hydroxide, and convert the arsenate salt to its acid form by adding hydrochloric acid. I keep adding acid until the pH is around 2, and a white precipitate of mostly unreacted arsenic trioxide forms. I then leave it to cool down to room temperature, to make more of it precipitate. All the white solid settles to the bottom, and I set it up for filtration to remove it. Since the residue is mostly the starting material, it can potentially be reused to do the reaction again. The filtrate contains the desired 2-chloroethyl arsenic acid. So I again set it up for distillation to remove all of the water and afterward, a bunch of solid is left behind, and some stuff has sublimed or steam distilled into the condenser. The solid mostly contains more arsenic trioxide, the product, and some side products. I then add a bunch of isopropyl alcohol to dissolve the product, while most of the rest of the material remains insoluble. I also place the short path upside down on the flask, and wash it out with isopropyl alcohol to get out some of the solid, just in case it is part of the product. I then shake the flask strongly, and break up the solid with a spatula. I then set this up for filtration, and wash it out several times with more isopropanol. I transfer all of the filter to a flask, and we see a small amount of solid has settled out, and sticks to the glass, though it doesn't seem to redissolve, so I'm not sure if that is part of the product. I then concentrate the solution down to a very small volume, and a yellowish suspension is left behind, that should contain the crude product. 
which I will set aside for now while I prepare the next reaction. Originally, I wanted to be good with this and measure the yields, but all of the products were either annoying and disgusting or are forwarded directly even in literature, so I let the chip sail. Now I set up a new flask with a stir bar and add in 160 ml of ethanol as a solvent and reactant. I then gradually add in 5.84 grams of metallic sodium, which immediately starts reacting to form sodium methoxide and hydrogen. I heat the mixture to a reflux to make it go faster. And when all of the sodium has disappeared, it is finished and I take it off heat, leaving us with a solution of sodium methoxide. Now, I add 41.6 grams of diethyl acetaminomalonate as a reactant and I leave this to stir for one hour. Afterward, it has become a suspension, to which I directly add all of the product from before. I wash out the flask with some ethanol, attach a condenser and leave it to reflux for four hours. In this reaction, 2-chloroethyl arsenic acid is used to alkylate the diethyl acetaminomalonate, which was deprotonated by the sodium ethoxide. In more detail, first, the center carbon of malonates contain a hydrogen that is fairly acidic and can be deprotonated by a base, such as sodium ethoxide, forming ethanol and the sodium salt of the malonate. The deprotonated product is an enolate, detailed by two resonance structures. Enolates are great nucleophiles, and so it will attack the electron deficient carbon adjacent to the chlorine from the 2 chloroethyl arsenic acid, kicking off the chlorine, forming sodium chloride and a final ethyl arsenic acid product. When I return, it is an orange-brown color and I immediately set it up for distillation to remove all of the solvent. When that's done, I dissolve it in a bunch of water and then also add a bunch of dichloromethane and move it all to a separatory funnel. I separate these layers, add a little bit more water to dilute it and wash the aqueous phase four more times with dichloromethane to remove most of the excess diethyl acetaminomalonate. I then take the water layer into this flask and distill off most of it. I am then left with a thick red goo, to which I add some 30% methanol in dichloromethane. I mix it around strongly to dissolve the product and precipitate out salts. It takes a while, but a precipitate forms, and I then filter all of that out. I again distill down the filtrate, but to a small volume. Now it is time to remove remaining diethyl acetaminomalonate since it is very stubborn and hopefully get a cleaner arsenic product. For that, I will have to use column chromatography. So I set up a column and weighed out about 100 grams of silica gel. I mix that with some 5% methanol in DCM and pour the slurry down the column. After letting it pack by running solvent through it multiple times, the silica is still very fragile because of this specific solvent mixture. So I carefully apply a layer of sand on top without tapping, otherwise it will sink into the silica. I then just wet load the concentrated syrupy solution of the product with some extra solvent and run it into the silica. I then just continuously elude it with 5% methanol in DCM until all of the yellow color has come out. And I then elude off the arsenic compound with 30% methanol in DCM. But I didn't film it all since it took a very long time. I then took the solution containing the arsenic compound and already started distilling off all of the solvent. When that's done, a yellow solid is left behind that contains the product. In literature, they mentioned they did the same column twice to remove all the diethyl acetaminomalonate, as it will form glycine in one of the next reactions that would be difficult to separate from the product. Since they do a very odd purification with a column that I don't have, I would just forward it to the next reaction, even if it still contains some diethyl acetaminomalonate. If my final product contains glycine because of that, it's not really a problem to see if it is antibiotic. Now to continue, I dissolve all of the solid in about 30 ml of 18% hydrochloric acid. And then add 54 mg of potassium iodide as a catalyst. Now I set up a sulfur dioxide generator by reacting sodium metabisulfite and sulfuric acid. I lead the produced sulfur dioxide through the tube and bubble the sulfur dioxide through the liquid. I also add some more 18% hydrochloric acid to make sure that there is enough and I then just let it run for 5 hours. In this reaction, the arsenic is reduced by sulfur dioxide from its 5 plus to 3 plus oxidation state. How it likely works is that a free electron pair from the sulfur of sulfur dioxide attacks the double bonded oxygen, of which one pair of bonded electrons moves onto the arsenic, reducing it to its 3 plus state. This leaves the arsenic with a formal negative charge and the sulfur with a positive charge. To balance those charges, the remaining arsenic oxygen bond moves to form a sulfur oxygen double bond kicking off sulfur trioxide, which will immediately react with water to form sulfuric acid, leaving us with the corresponding arsine compound. 
After this, the mixture is basified to form the corresponding sodium salt. When I return, it looks almost the same. I then neutralize all the acid and basify the solution to a pH of about 11, with a 6 molar sodium hydroxide solution. It again looks basically the same, and the solution can immediately be used for the next reaction. Since I don't feel like waiting for it to cool down, I directly add in 28 ml of methyl iodide and quickly attach a large condenser. I then leave this mixture to reflux at 50 C for 4 hours. In this reaction, the arsenic compound is methylated by methyl iodide and returns to its 5 plus oxidation state. How it works is that a free electron pair from the arsenic that it just gained in the last reaction attacks the electron deficient carbon of the methyl iodide, kicking off the iodine. At the same time, an electron pair from one of the oxygens forms a double bond with the arsenic, resulting in a methylated arsenic compound, along with sodium iodide. When I return, a precipitate has formed, which are probably just salts. I don't have to remove any of the salts, since it doesn't matter for the next reaction. I evaporate off all of the solvent, and then for the next reaction, I add in 100 ml of water and 100 ml of concentrated hydrochloric acid. It immediately turns orange, and I remove the acid vapors so we can see it better, by flushing it with nitrogen. I then set this mixture up for a reflux for 3 hours. In this reaction, we are completing the malonic ester synthesis by hydrolysis of the esters, a decarboxylation, and an amide hydrolysis, all with aqueous acid and heat. First, a carbonyl oxygen of one of the esters is protonated by the acid, then the resulting oxocarbenium carbon undergoes nucleophilic attack from water, and a pair of bond electrons move onto the oxygen to give a hydroxyl. The attached water is then immediately deprotonated by another water molecule to give a second hydroxyl group. Now, the adjacent ether can be protonated by the same acid. The resulting protonated ether is then kicked off as ethanol, and a free electron pair from one of the hydroxyl oxygens moves to form a double bond, giving this protonated carboxylic acid that can be deprotonated by another water molecule. This molecule can then undergo decarboxylation in a concerted reaction when heated where the ester carbonyl is protonated by the carboxylic acid, those hydrogen-oxygen bond electrons move to form a carbon-oxygen double bond, and the carbon-carbon bond electrons move over to form a carbon-carbon double bond. This forces one pair of the protonated carbonyl double bond electrons onto the oxygen to give a hydroxyl, resulting in the loss of carbon dioxide and this enol compound. This enol tautomerizes to the following keto form that is massively more favored than normal, as it is an ester, which almost exclusively exists in its keto form. The resulting intermediate undergoes another acid catalyzed ester hydrolysis and also an acid catalyzed amide hydrolysis, of which the mechanism is basically the same. In the end, we are left with the product arsinotricin. When it is finished, it has become red, and I first distill off part of the solvent, then I neutralize it with some sodium hydroxide. When it becomes neutral, it changes colors to yellow, and I remove the resulting precipitate of insoluble impurities by filtration. I then return it to the heating block and distill off the rest of the solvent. When it's all gone, an off-white solid is left behind, containing salts and the product. I suspend it in some methanol, which will dissolve the product while remaining salts are insoluble. I again filter out all of the solid and I am left with a yellow filtrate that contains the arsenic product. I distill it to dryness and then a yellowish solid is left behind, which contains the final arsinotricin product. Like I said before, it is quite difficult to purify and requires weird special columns. So I will take it and test it as is. It will still contain some impurities, mostly glycine like I mentioned earlier, from hydrolyzed diethyl acetaminomalonate. Now I dissolve all of it in water to make a relatively concentrated solution of the arsinothricin. I have bought some pre-made Muller-Hinton agar plates that are specific for antibiotic testing Normally this is done by placing small paper discs in the agar that are soaked with the antibiotic. The antibiotic will then diffuse into the agar and show a circle around the disc where bacteria don't grow, if it is effective. I don't have all of that and F biology. So I will just do a quick test to give an indication. And for that, it also doesn't matter if everything isn't perfectly sterile. The first plate is my control, which I inoculate with 0.1 ml of a 50-50 mixture of my spit and water. I spread it around the whole plate with an inoculation loop. Then the second plate, I inoculate with 0.1 ml of a 50-50 mixture of my spit and the arsenic antibiotic solution. I then wrap them in parafilm to keep them from drying out and let them sit in a regular oven at 37C for about 5 days. After that, I take them out of the oven and as we can see, 
the control plate looks all nasty like this, and it also stinks. Now I'm actually surprised, because my plate with the antibiotic is pretty much fully clean. There's just some parafilm residue there, but I don't see any growth on the plate, unless I'm blind. Does that mean it worked, or that I messed up? I don't have any way to analyze this compound, so we're just going to assume it worked. Either way, it's about the journey, not the destination. Bye.